Well, good morning. It is Wednesday morning. We are in the histories. We're in 2 Kings chapters 16 and 17. And multitasking. Uh, are you any good at it? Because uh, multitasking, it's a good thing, right? Able to do many things at the same time and, and keep everything kind of running and spinning. Of course, the criticism is, is that uh, blokes generally are hopeless at multitasking. Uh, but that's actually not what this passage shows us. Um, I want to suggest that in this passage we're shown that actually multitasking, at least in one area, is terrible. Um, but let's m move in and think about these chapters. Um, if you haven't read them, helpful to read through. This is a really pivotal section in uh, Two Kings. We get to the, the dark and sad events of the exile. Um, Amaziah uh, has died. Uh, Ahaz has taken the throne in Judah. And uh, of course, the throne in Judah for uh, now decades, for generations, has been positively led. Uh, kings that have done um, good in the eyes of the Lord, although that all changes, as we saw uh, hinted at last week, with the arrival of Ahaz, who does evil in the eyes of the Lord. And, um, and in fact, he even does the most detestable of things. We're told early on in these chapters that uh, unlike David, he did not do what was right. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. They were to come into the land and worship only God, but they don't do that. They come into the land and they start to observe the practices of the pagan nations, even to the point of sacrificing their children in order to appease those gods who are no gods at all. And yet he offers sacrifices and burnt offerings on the high places, on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. His idolatry is pervasive. And in fact, it's, uh, it's shown in the way in which he removes himself from worshipping God in the temple, in the place that David had established um, and Solomon had built. And now he even has constructed an Assyrian altar where he'll pour out uh, generous amounts of sacrifices to pagan gods. And he even then takes the temple um, silver and gold and in order to appease the Assyrians he then sells it off in order to kind of win favour but none of that works and we read these terrible words in verse 6 of chapter 17 in the ninth year of Hoshea king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria the exile has begun and in fact then you get from verse 7 onwards the description of those events and as to why it's taken place. And it's almost a reversal of the Ten Commandments. Uh, God has met with Moses on Mount Sinai, listed out the things that they might do in obedience to him. And here we see that now listed out all the things that they have done against God. And in that, we're told all of these events that roused God's anger. So in verse 18, we read, So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. There goes Israel in the north, God's people, taken off into exile. Uh, only the tribe of Judah is left there in Jerusalem. But notice verse 19, Even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices of Israel that had introduced, and therefore the Lord rejected all the people of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hands of the plunderers until he thrust them from his presence. Of course, we'll read on and we'll see that actually Judah is retained for a time and we will see some good and high points to come. But it's almost like the clock is ticking, uh, the inevitability of uh, future exile to come even to them. Of course, you get this picture of Samaria being settled. The Assyrians come in and they are dumping people into the vacant land. Uh, only they discover that they don't know how to worship the God of that land. You have the incident with the lions in verse 25. So they bring a priest to teach them how to worship. And now they're going to worship Yahweh and they're going to worship the gods that they previously worshipped. And that's what I was talking about before, a form of multitasking that is a terrible thing to do. But they are very good at it. In fact, they're so good at it that when you come to the end of this chapter, in verse 41, you read these words. Even while these people were worshipping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. And so here's the tragedy in these chapters. Um, God has established a covenant for his people. He's reminded of them, of them of that in this chapter, in verse 35. When the Lord made a covenant... With Israel, he commanded them, do not serve 
Do not worship the other gods and bow down to them and serve or sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you out of Egypt with a mighty and an outstretched arm is the one you must worship. To him you shall bow down. Do not forget the covenant they are told in verse 38. Rather, worship the Lord your God. It is he who will deliver you from the hands of your enemies. And do they listen? No, they don't. Verse 40. They would not have listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. And I know that we've hit this topic again and again in these histories as we've moved through, as we've seen king after king lead the nation uh, into idolatry. But here we see this syncretistic practice, this multitasking that, oh, yes, we will worship. Oh, yes, we will hold the covenant. But they don't remember the exclusive claim of the covenant, that if you absorbed yourself into the covenant, it pushed out the other worships that you might have. But here... God's people and even people that are coming in to take the land over them think that they could kind of appease God and he'll become one of the number. And that's not going to be the case. It is him and him alone. And so as we come to these chapters this morning, it prompts us, doesn't it, to ask the same question. Um, Are you good at multitasking in the area of your worship? That even while the people were worshipping the Lord, they were serving their idols. Is that what I do? Am I still serving the idols, the things that I think keep me safe and happy and bring pleasure to me, appeasing the things around me, giving myself to false worships and yet still worshipping God? So all of the outward exterior that looks like I'm a a worshipper of Yahweh and yet I'm still serving the idols of the culture around me. That idea of being in the world and of the world. And I think that's the call that we need to come to think about this morning. The thing that Jesus actually rebukes the Pharisees for for doing and calling people back to a heart devotion. Don't merely be about the act of sacrifice, but to obey is better than sacrifice. And so will you join me in prayer as we examine ourselves this morning with this idea of the folly of multitasking in our worship and of coming to God and recognising that he is the one who is the Lord of all, who brings us out of our slavery to sin and into a life that is everlasting. And so we ought not forget the new covenant that he has made for us in Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that it would be to you and you alone that we would bow down and we would give our lives as an offering to you. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would Think of you and what it means to worship you and not to worship other gods. Lord, we can be forgetful. We cannot listen, but we can persist in our former practices. Lord, would you help us to be those who would worship you and not serve other idols simultaneously? And so, Heavenly Father, while we read a sad story, terribly sad story, of the end of your nation in the north, taken into exile. We recognise that you are also the God who kept a remnant, that there remained a people faithful to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us, equip us to be faithful in our time, holding fast to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.